Okay, good afternoon everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. My name is Nazem Chichek. I'm the Associate Dean Research for the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences. And it's my pleasure to chair today's seminar. And uh, before we get going, I'd like to welcome you back on campus. Hopefully you had a great summer. Did some stuff beyond work. Uh, you know, spent some time with family and friends and fully energized back on campus. So welcome back. This is the first of our fall uh, presentation, seminars, conversation series that we're holding today. And uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I just want to let you know that we kind of thought about a theme for the next few lectures and uh, seminar series talks. They center on international collaborations and work we do uh, internationally and uh, the partners we work with that either come here or we visit them and part of that theme is to uh, you know, have a call out to our researchers to discuss some of that work they're doing, the challenges, opportunities uh, you know, that they see in working uh, globally. So hopefully uh, you know, today's lecture and others will give you a sense of our global reach and, and kind of the challenges and opportunities that that brings. All right, so maybe I'll uh, go ahead and introduce our speaker and close colleague of mine from uh, my department, Dr. David Levin. Uh, David is a professor in the Department of Biosystems Engineering here at the University of Manitoba. He re received his bachelor's degree in environmental studies at the University of Waterloo in 1977. So David must have been six years old when that happened. He looks very young. That's another talk on how to stay young. Um, his master's of science degree from the University of Guelph in entomology in 1979 and his PhD from McGill University in Virology in 1987. So you see his very background in multidisciplinary uh, reach, reach. After a postdoc at the National Research Council of Canada in Montreal and working as a research associate at York University, David joined the University of Victoria as assistant professor in the Department of Biology in 1991. In 2006, we were lucky enough to attract him back to Manitoba, where his roots are, and David joined our department at the University of Manitoba then. David's research is focused on biotechnologies for sustainability, including biofuels, biodegradable polymers, bioremediation, microbial and enzy en enzymatic degradation of synthetic polymers, and microbial production of antioxidants. His research is highly multidisciplinary and integrates microbiology, biotechnology, and genome sciences with bioprocess and biosystems engineering. So please help me welcome David. Okay, uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here, a bit of an honor. I'm a little bit nervous because I know, you know I'm really good one-on-one, -on -one, but not so good in, in large groups. But um, so I want to tell you a little bit about how I got here um, before I get into all of the collaborations and things that I developed. Um, and so let's see, how do we do this? Okay, right, so I grew up in Winnipeg, in the north end of Winnipeg. I went to St. John's High School, which is in the tough end of the city, right? So, uh, and because um, I, well, and then I was fortunate enough to you know, well, when I was like in grade seven, I was short and fat, and I was the smart kid in the, in the class, so I got bullied a lot, right? But then by the time I got to grade 10, I was a little bit taller and stronger, and then I played football for the St. John's Tigers. Um, they wound up in my senior year, I was the middle linebacker, and sort of selected as the, the MOP, most um, outstanding player for the city, as a defensive player, which was good for my ego. Um, um, and then I uh, actually had an opportunity to play, so I did my first year university at Manitoba, and I had an opportunity where I was sort of being recruited to play for the Bisons, but I had to make a decision, right? I had to say, well, do I play football or do I study, and if, I can't do both because I'm the kind of guy that focus 100% on what I do, and if I played football, I wouldn't do very well at school, so I said, no, no, I'm going to study. So I did my first year of university, but like most young people, I was pretty dazed and confused. I had no idea what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go or even who I was. You know. so, um, so in the second year, the next year, I went to University of Waterloo and uh, to this Man and Environment program, which is a liberal arts or humanities program about 
humans, human activities, economics, and uh, sustainable development. And this was back in 1972, 73. It was the time of the first oil crisis when the OPEC com countries decided to hike up the price of oil and there was a big, uh, a big um, I don't know, problem with uh, the global economy because of the price of oil was very high. So when I was at uh, Waterloo, I studied philosophy. I read all of the classical you know, Greek philosophies and studied history, uh, mostly ancient history, um, and economics. And at that time, they, you know, the limits to growth and small, are beautiful, small is beautiful are the, were the kind of the Bibles for the young people who wanted to change the world. Okay, so, so I got into that and um, trying to kind of find some answers about, you know, how do I fit into this world, which is very confusing and full of problems. So I did that, and I still was pretty dazed and confused at that time, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do or who I was. <clears throat> but then I discovered this guy, Karl Popper. Karl Popper is a philosopher of science who wrote uh, a book called The Logic of Scientific Discovery in 1959. And really it was a rejection of classical inductivism in favor of empirical falsification. Well, you know, it's a lot of fancy words, but basically the idea of conjecture and refutation. We make up stories about our universe. Every culture throughout the history of humanity has made up stories about where they come from, where they belong, and uh, what, how to be good human beings, essentially. Um, and for, for millennia, our cultures were dominated by faith, by the belief in something in the absence of evidence. And Karl Popper and other philosophers of science came along and said, well, we can confirm what's real and what's not by doing experiments. And uh, through experimental procedures, we can determine, we can gather evidence, and we can determine whether the evidence supports the story or not. And if it supports the story, the story stands. If it doesn't, then you have to change the story. So knowledge evolves. And this resonated with me a lot. So this basically said, aha. I can, I can understand this, this, I, you know, this grabs me. And about the same time, I fell in love with insects. So I worked on a farm for a couple of summers that, in an, uh, that had an apple orchard and I kind of became de facto responsible for um, analyzing, looking at the insects that ate the apples and figuring out how to control them without using pesticides. And that led me to the University of Guelph uh, where I studied entomology and biological control of insects, which is the, uh, to, to sort of understand insect ecology and how agricultural practices inf influence insect populations and what we can do to, uh, to sort of mimic what happens in nature rather than using chemical pesticides. Can we f see what happens, what nature does to figure out how to control insect populations in a sustainable way? So. So I went to Guelph and studied entomology, and my research was area was biological control of insects, which using parasites, predators, and pathogens to regulate insect populations. And my particular project was basically studying the interaction between a little green caterpillar called the cabbage worm. Anybody, far, you know, uh, people who are maybe um, uh, have gardens. And if you grow cabbage, you sometimes get these you know, velvet-colored caterpillars, which are this caterpillar of the small white butterfly called Py Pyaris rapi. Well, like every organism on the planet, there is a virus that attacks this insect. And there's also parasitic wasps that lay eggs in them. And so my project was to figure out what's the dynamic between the, the parasitoid wasp laying eggs in the caterpillar and or a virus getting infected with the virus, with the caterpillar getting infected with the virus, and then what's the outcome? If the virus infects first and then the parasitoid lays an egg, what happens to the parasitoid? Or if the parasitoid lays an egg first and it gets infected, can the parasitoid emerge and then transmit the virus to another insect? So it was pretty, pretty cool stuff for me, anyway, because when I had a humanities background, I didn't really have a science background, but I had to pick up some courses along the way, like biochemistry and microbiology and stuff like that. Anyway, so I, at that time, and through that, I kind of learned that viruses are really cool. So then suddenly, I mean, I had love insects, but ooh, now I love viruses. <laughs> so, um, so after my master's, I went to Africa. I went to Botswana, Malawi, and Kenya, and I was collecting insects 
and sort of uh, preserving them in alcohol and then eventually sending them back to uh, researchers at Agriculture Canada in, Agriculture Canada in Ottawa. Okay, thank you. Um, and that was an amazing adventure. Uh, and through that, eventually I, so that's where I was collecting insects for AAFC. Um, and then through that, I kind of uh, wound up getting a job offer at the University of Guelph in the veterinary college um, to basically study the transmission of encephalitis virus by mosquitoes. So here was like the, the merger of my two fascinations with life, insects and viruses, it was perfect, okay. So I did that for a couple of years, uh, from May 1980 to August 1981. And then I went to McGill for my PhD in virology, but I wound up studying bacteriophages, because bacteriophages are viruses that infect, infect bacteria. And at that time, it was the develop when biotechnology and molecular biology were really just starting to become to their forefront to, as a power, of powerful tools for studying molecular processes, right? So it was a trial by fire, and as, you know, um, who's that, was Charles Dickens who wrote, um, the, you know, who said the, the best of times and the worst of times at the beginning of uh, that book, whatever that book is, right? So my PhD was the best of times and the worst of times, working 24-7, uh, working with a professor who had just come from Cold Spring Harbor in New York, and his supervisor was uh, James Watson, who was the discoverer of the, co-discoverer of the structure of, the, of DNA. So it was 24-7, eat, sleep, drink, dream, uh, work, or science. And so I learned a lot. I learned a lot, and but the main thing I learned was if I ever became a professor, never to treat my students the way that my supervisor treated us. <laughs> and that's a whole other story I won't go into. Okay, so after I finished my PhD, I went, I had a postdoc at the National Research Council in Montreal for a year working on a virus specific to insects called baculovirus, molecular biology. And then I got a job in Toronto for a company called ProbeTech that wanted to bring DNA fingerprinting to Canada because it was a time when paternity testing and forensics was just becoming a thing. So I got to go to, to uh, the FBI in Quantico and learn about DNA fingerprinting technology. Um, but the professor, the person who owned the company, ProbeTech, was a professor at York University and he was a great scientist. He actually won the Stacy Award and a bunch of things like that. But he was a terrible businessman and the company went out of business within a year. So then I worked for him as a kind of research associate for, uh, for a year or two. And then wound up getting a job at the University of Victoria in the Department of Biology. Okay. So, um, I went to, buy, to UVic at two, uh, 1991, and there I was in a department of biology, and I was studying the molecular biology of these baculoviruses, viruses, and um, they're developing them as tools for biological control of insect populations. Um, and in about that time, there was a humongous outbreak of, a, of an insect pest called the balsam fir sawfly in the Maritimes that had infested hundreds of thousands of hectares and was killing all the trees. And of course, the logging companies don't want the insects to kill the trees. They want to cut down the trees and kill them themselves so that we can sell them for wood. So I, with the Canadian Forest Service people, we developed this particular virus called the Neodyprian abiatus NPV, nucleopolyhydrosis virus, as a biological control agent to control the balsam fir sawfly, and we were successful, and there were field trials which showed that there was you know, 90% reduction of the insect population after being sprayed, and then it became registered, and now it's a tool that Canadian Forest Service uses to control this pest whenever it flares up as a, as a problem. So it really demonstrated that these kinds of natural occurring viruses can be used as biological control agents to control insect populations. Um, okay. So, However, about the same time, uh, when I was at UVic in biology, there was in, in the engineering department, there was something called the Institute for Integrated Energy Systems. And I guess I was on some committee with the director of that center, and, and he basically asked me, well, I mean, we, there was a lot of discussion at that time about the hydrogen economy. That's when the hydrogen economy was becoming really a hot issue, and Ballard um, Energy in Vancouver was building hydrogen fuel cell bus, uh, engines for buses, 
and they were going to transform the global economy using hydrogen. So the director of the center asked me, are there biological ways of producing hydrogen? And I said, hmm, interesting idea, because then you could sort of have a whole system, a hydrogen economy based on basically biological degradation of waste to produce hydrogen gas. I said, okay, well, I don't know anything about it, but I'll look into it. Um, and I did. And what it came to, to the kind of the sur bubble to the surface is using cellulitic bacteria, anaerobic cellulitic bacteria, because cellulose is the most abundant biomass on the, on the planet, and we have lots of it, and it's cheap. And if we had bacteria that could break it down and produce hydrogen, well then, you've got a source of hydrogen that's doing a natural carbon recycling process anyway. And well, by the way, it only, not only produces hydrogen, it produces ethanol. So, so I looked into that, but I, again, I, you know, I was an insect virology guy, insect pathologist, not a microbial genomics you know, fermentation guy. So I looked around and I found some colleagues at the University of Manitoba, because I was at UVic still, right? So Nazem Cicic, who you've just met, and Richard Sparling in microbiology seemed to have the expertise that I was thinking about if I wanted to kind of do this kind of research because uh, Richard Sparling is a microbial physiology guy, a biochemist in, in microbiology who has a deep understanding of anaerobic metabolism. And Nazem is an expert in fermentation. So if we were going to use bacteria to do direct fermentation of cellulose to produce biofuels, this would be the perfect team. So I, I sent them an email out of the blue, and luckily they responded. Do you remember that? Yeah. So and they were very positive, and so we wrote a grant together, an NSERC Collaborative Research and Development Grant in 2002, and it was approved, surprisingly. <laughs> And then that led to a sabbatical that I took in 2003 to come to the University of Manitoba and start working on the project. Right? So that was the beginning of a really exciting period. Um, and then that success in that collaborative research and development grant led directly to a proposal to Genome Canada with Richard and, and Nazem uh, that, uh, that was also approved. So we got a, well, we got $5 million from Genome Canada, plus $5 million in various supporting funds, partly from the province of Manitoba and collaborators in the United States. Um, and we got a $10 million program, which basically this summarizes, but it's too much detail to go into. But the point is that we had a plan from going from uh, bacteria to looking at uh, the degradation or the uh, production of the gas and then um, cloning and the genes or ge the genome sequencing and looking at the transcriptomics and the proteomics and metabolic engineering. And we basically did all that stuff. It was amazing. We had, at one point we had, between us, we had 20 graduate students and postdocs. And in the end, the outcomes were very significant. We had five major international collaborations, 11 invention disclosures, six industrial partners, four novel bacteria that were isolated and characterized, 13 annotated genome sequences, four tools for the analysis of transcriptomes and proteomes from our colleagues in the University of Manitoba, um, 77 peer-reviewed publications, 13 book chapters, and 25 HQP trained. So that was great. It could have retired at that point. <laughs> but. Collaborations led to the acquisition of advanced materials, advanced instrumentation. So we had a collaboration, part of our international collaboration with, was with a group in New Zealand called Scion Research. And one of the researchers there, which I'll introduce in a minute, was a fermentation expert who developed something called a titration and off-gas analysis system, or a TOGA system. And through this Genome Canada project, we were able to acquire one of these. And this, it's an amazing tool because in the fermentation reactor, we can measure the off-gas, the volatiles that are being produced during fermentation in real time, both in the supernatant and in the aqueous phase. Um, and the, so we can measure if there's hydrogen production or CO2 production or consumption of various products. And that led to 
And, and that instrument is unique in North America. There's no other city or country, city or province or university that has this tool in North America. And, um, and, it, and because of that, or partly as, as a, because we can measure gas consumption or production in real time, now we have a collaboration with a, a visiting PhD student from the University of North Dakota, Peter Owade, who's looking at C1 gas fermentation, that is the ability of bacteria to utilize carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide as a carbon source to produce ethanol. So this tool is really, really a wonderful uh, outcome from this Genome Canada project. Now, the, these, the Genome Canada project and also led to success in HQP. So, so this collaboration with Scion Research one of our PhDs at the time, Carlo uh, Carrera, wound up going to spend some time in the laboratory of this guy, Matt Stott, at Scion Research in New Zealand, and eventually is now a senior lecturer, which is the equivalent of an associate professor at, the, at Canterbury University in New Zealand. Another one of our PhD students, Warren Blunt, uh, who was the one who worked exclusively with this TOGA system for his PhD, he went to New Zealand to work with this guy, Daniel Gapes, who was the guy who invented and built the TOGA system for us. Uh, and now, of course, Warren is an assistant professor in the Department of Biosystems Engineering. So we had two super good students who had really great experiences with our international collaborators and that has led to their, you know, to a, a successful career path for them. So that's great. We had another student, a visiting student from China, Ting Ting, who worked in the lab um, and I, and for, a, for a couple of years and then went back and then I was asked to be the, her external examiner on her PhD thesis and oral. So I got to go to China, to Wuhan and spent a couple of weeks there. And then um, because of our success with these the, the Genome Canada project had led to new opportunities, right? So it led to the direct uh, offer or invitation to participate in something called the Hydrogen Canada Network, which was one of these NSERC strategic networks that used to be available and no longer available. But 2008 to 2013, I was a, a member of this Hydrogen Canada Network. I was the leader of Theme B, which is the, uh, the theme that was responsible for hydrogen production and purification. And then we also got, in, I also got invited to participate in this, uh, another strategic network called BiofuelNet from 2012 to 2017. Okay, yeah, because again, because of this cellulose fermentation, not only producing hydrogen, but also producing ethanol. So, um, and then those collaborations or the work in those networks led to new research opportunities. So out of the Genome Canada project, it was mostly about cellulose fermentation by anaerobic bacteria to produce hydrogen and ethanol, but we also had a small side project um, on co-products, which was production of these uh, biopolymers called polyhydroxyl alkoinates. And of all of the success that we had with that Genome Canada project, the one that really was sustained and which we're still working on now are the bio, is the biopolymer stuff. Actually, Dr. Sparling took over the anaerobic cellulose fermentation stuff and he's still working on that. And I sort of split off and said, okay, I'm gonna focus on the polymer stuff. And that has led to all kinds of wonderful opportunities as, as well. So uh, one of the collaborations that's come out of the biopolymer stuff is with Dr. Song Liu in biosystems engineering and we're looking at uh, using biopolymers to to make uh, biodegradable packaging, food packaging material. And uh, we have a wonderful post, uh, PhD student work on, working on that, Quinn Letke, and he's just an amazing kid and he's doing an incredibly good job in blending different biodegradable mm -hmm. polymers, sorry, together to give them the physical and thermal properties that would be more equivalent to, the, to synthetic polymers like polyethylene. Right, because the thing about the biodegradable polymers is that they're great for biodegradation, but they don't have the physical and thermal properties that are needed that are equivalent to or even similar enough to synthetic polymers like polyethylene, polypropylene, to really 
so that they can displace them in the market. But if we blend, say, poly polylactic acid and PBAT, polybutylene ad adipote terephthalate, we can get a polymer that's biodegradable but is close to polyethylene in its physical and thermal properties. So that's the kind of stuff that we're doing with Song. And then we have a collaboration with Dr. Card Silvia Cardona in microbiology and Ned Budisa in chemistry looking at polymer degrading enzymes um, that can be, be basically enzymes that can degrade polymers and trying to understand the mechanisms of biodegradation of polymers. Why are plastics so hard to degrade? And what can we do to improve that? And we can't figure that out until we have the enzymes and that can interact with the substrate and understand the mechanism of that enzyme, how it works, how it interacts with the substrate, how it binds, and what are the factors that limit its ability to degrade, right? So we have some, we've isolated three bacteria. My, my PhD student here, uh, Trin, has got three bacteria that can degrade polyethylene, but only about 30%. And we're kind of on the track now to understand what are the enzymes that are secreted by these bacteria to degrade the polyethylene. And then once we've identified the genes that encode those enzymes, we can clone and express them and put them into vectors that Dr. Boudissa and Hamid in chemistry are working on that can display those enzymes on the surface of the bacteria. I keep hitting that. And then we have a, 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 some bacteria that can, that have cell surface display of these polymer degrading enzymes. And now we have a tool that we can use to degrade plastics, okay? But at the same time, we have to understand what are the factors that limit that degradation. And one of them is the polymer structure itself because the high degree, most of these polymers that we use every day, polyethylene, polypropylene things, have a high degree of crystallinity. That's why they're so useful. But it's that high degree of crystallinity that prevents the enzymes from attacking them. The enzymes seem to preferentially attack the amorphic regions. So what we may have to do is some treat the plastic so that it reduces the degree of crystallinity and it makes the, the polymers more open and more uh, accessible to the enzymes to degrade. But this is a hypothesis that we're working on and we will hopefully get to in a, well, sooner than later, I hope. Anyway, um, then there's another research uh, collaboration that developed out of spontaneously, really, because there were three students from Italy, Giovanna Seracusa, Alessandra Bardi, and Ilaria Kika, who were actually visiting students in civil engineering. And they were working on biodegradation of, um, uh, what were they working on? Um, uh, uh, pollutants that are caused by the tanning industry, tannins essentially, right? Um, but the professor that they were working with in, in civil engineering is not a microbiologist and didn't really have the facility, so they wound up working in my lab. And through them, I got to know, what, know them, knew them well, became their sort of surrogate mentor, and then uh, got to know their supervisor, Simona Di Gregorio at the Department of Biology in, in uh, University of Pisa. And then when they went back, I, was, I served as their external examiner on their PhD theses and then on the oral exam. So I get to go to Italy two or three times. And eventually then I took a sabbatical in, in Italy for, th for three months, which was a wonderful experience. Um, and uh, so that was kind of a, a great collaboration that developed and is still going. And one of the Students from Dr. Gregorio's lab here is, uh, well, I'll come back to that, uh, which I'll introduce in a minute. And then I had another visiting PhD student from Iran who just, who had wrote to me because of the papers we published and said that she was, wanted to come and work with, my, with our group on polymer degradation. Um, and so I said, okay, sure. And so luckily she, was, she got a visa, she came to Canada. So Zara was a visiting PhD student from 2017 to 2018 from the Ferdowsi University in Mashhad, of Mashhad in Iran. And she initiated our studies on the microbial degradation of polyethylene and did a fantastic job. And we got three papers in from that one year of work that she did. Then she went back to Iran, she finished her PhD. I invited her back as a, as a postdoc, but unfortunately because of whatever, uh, I, her, she hasn't been able to get a visa to come back because of the country that she's in. So, so that's unfortunate. But the work that she initiated is now being carried on by Trin, and we're making really great progress in that area. Um, 
yeah, and then from that, actually, another kind of fortuitous collaboration developed with the National Institute of Agricultural Science in South Korea. So the, the rural, real, rural, real rural Development Administration, RDA, is the equivalent of sort of Agriculture Canada in, in Korea. And the NIAS is a major facility, uh, research facility in Korea. And they came to me and said they would give, they would fund a research program. So we get 65,000 a year for five years, so $325,000. And my collaboration with Dr. An, Jae-yun Hong, Jae Hong An, who is now, has been in my lab now. He came in February, he's been in the lab uh, and will stay until December. And he's working with Trin and others in the student in the lab on microbial degradation of plastics. Another fortuitous development was that the NRC, the National Research of Canada, ha now has a mandate to look at composting of plastics. So they came to my group and said um, they want to develop a project to look at composting of polylactic acid. Now polylactic acid is a polymer that's made from renewable sources, basically lactic acid, from lactic acid producing bacteria and it's polymerized into a polymer. Um, and it's biodegradable. Unfortunately, it's not biodegradable at ambient temperature. It needs 60 degrees to be biodegradable. And uh, when I was in Italy in 2018 on my sabbatical, the European Union had banned polyethylene bags in grocery stores, and then they started to replace them with PLA bags. And you probably all have seen this if you bought compostable bags and they're really flimsy and they tear very easily. So then you have to double, triple bag them to put your groceries in, you bring them home. Oh, it's biodegradable, so you throw it out. And, it, and then so they had a tsunami of plastic going to the, to the municipal landfills or their composting systems, and they didn't degrade. And so then the European Union said, oh, well, PLA is not biodegradable, so we ban it. So they ban PLA as well. So what we have to do now is try to develop composting systems and understand why it's not degradable at room temperature and develop, uh, isolate microbes and engineer enzymes that can um, degrade the PLA. And the key may be this thing about the crystallinity. If we can reduce the crystallinity, then the enzymes may be able to attack it better. So we have... Uh, Catherine Romero, in, in a postdoc that's working with Dr. Budisa and I and Dr. Hamid uh, on this cloning and expression of these polymer degrading enzymes. And that led to being a, now I'm a faculty advisor to this student, undergraduate student run program called International Genetically Engineered Machines, or iGEM in which they are trying to engineer bacteria to degrade plastic. So the Dr. Budisa and, and I and Hamid are kind of advisors, and we have at least a couple of the iGEM students in the, in the group here. And they will be going to Paris in, in November for this competition, this global competition of iGEM with, from students all over the world doing various projects. And hopefully we'll, and, and last year they, they actually won second place the, the team that was supervised by Dr. Budisa won second place, and they developed a bacteria that could, that could uh, kill um, zebra mussels or something like that, right? So, so there's lots of exciting stuff going on and lots of connections that we can make. So, um, so an, yeah, so another sort of out, out spin-off from the collaboration with Dr. Di Gregorio in, in Italy is that Luca Nicolini is in the lab now, and He's been here since, I guess, February, and will stay till December. Or is it October? Yeah, December, right? And now he, he has, uh, there were five fungal strains that he isolated from the Mediterranean Sea in Italy, or from the coast in Italy. And uh, we've tested them in the lab, and all five of them seem to be able to degrade uh, polybutylene succinate, and at least one of them can, can utilize LDPE, low-density polyethylene, as a carbon source, right? And so now he's, we're collaborating with the, uh, the Canadian Grain Commission, there, who has a lab in this building, uh, Sean uh, Wakowiak, right? Sean Wakowiak is fantastically generous, and he's, uh, he's working with Luca and teaching him how to do the sequencing, uh, and then the genome assembly and the annotation of these five um, species, which is great. 
fantastic. Um, and then, uh, and then we have Dr. Bruno Fernandes from Brazil, who uh, came to my lab um, as a kind of a scholar from with CNPQ from Brazil, right? And her thing is she's a, working in a department of uh, uh, civil and environmental engineering in, in Pernambuco, University of Pernambuco in the northeast of Brazil. And there was a big oil spill there some years ago, and she and her team have been isolating bacteria that are oil-degrading bacteria. So she came, she got, brought a couple of her bacteria. She also brought a postdoc who came and she's gone. And they're studying these two bacteria uh, that can degrade oil, and they've shown definitively that they can degrade polyaromatic hydrocarbons like uh, phenanthrene, which is great work. But we also found that they can also degrade plastic. So now we're developing a collaboration. We're going to apply for a we're working on a proposal to the NSERC and Alliance Industrial Catalyst Grant, which gave us $25,000 to do student exchanges or faculty exchanges uh, over the next couple of years. Um, and we'll see where that leads. And hopefully that will lead to some, some other funding and more students to come, right? So that's basically the take home messages are that if you make friends, you can develop international research network that can lead to new research opportunities, develop and you know, give you really good HQP training opportunities, and hopefully lead to more funding. But how do you do this, right? It's not every researcher who can do this. It depends on the kind of research that you do and how flexible and open you are to talking to people and envisioning how your research expertise can complement that of somebody else. So how do you do it? Well, you communicate. Talk to people, listen to people, right? We all go to conferences, you give your talk, you talk to people over coffee, whatever, but do you really make a close connection and really listen to what they're doing and see how your research can complement somebody else or theirs can complement yours? Um, so you have to be open to new ideas, you have to envision how your research interests are complementary with others, and you have to accept and mentor visiting students visiting HQP. I mean, I think that was the key to most of our, my collaborations are really started with students who showed up or were asked to come or, and then led to under, meeting their supervisors. As I said, certainly this is the situation with, with Dr. Di Gregorio in, in Italy, right? I met the students first and then through them met her and then there was a good synergy between what we're, what we're doing. Um, and then the main thing is just be generous and be kind. And um, I think good things will come. So anyway, that's the story for today. Any questions? Oh, a fantastic talk. And uh, you know, with a great message at the end. Thanks, David. Um, you know, certainly the products are in the room, right? So yeah. we can chat more about that. But uh, it's, we have a bit of time. I'm going to leave you at the microphone sure. to answer questions. And I'll try to facilitate a Q&A if you have any. Questions, this would be the time to pose them to David. Yes. That was awesome, and your research sounds fascinating. How hard is it to travel with microbes? You said that, that you brought microbes with you. Is that a, is that a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> or did you see <laughs> <laughs> that? No, if, if, they are, if they're considered level one organisms, uh, or generally considered safe, grass, generally accepted as safe, um, generally regarded as safe, G-R-A-S, grass, then there's no problem. They can be shipped by post, by mail, right? So that's mostly what we do, mostly. <laughs> Probably not in your suitcase, but it's not <laughs> as means. Each country has their own regulation. You must right. check the regulation for each country. Yeah. yeah, so each country has their own regulations, and not only to receive, but also to send, right? So we had to go through this process of understanding both in for the Brazil and with Italy for the five strains that, that Luca got. Yeah. And if there's any connection, for example, fungal strains in, in, in the genus Aspergillus are very suspect because a lot of Aspergillus are plant pathogens, right? So we have to be able to demonstrate that they are not plant pathogens, which means you need a genome sequence and you have to identify that there are no pathogenic islands in the genome, et cetera, et cetera. 
right? So it becomes harder for things that are related to plant pathogens, but if they're distantly related, then there's no problem. For example, the five strains that species that Luca was able to bring are all marine, right? They're saltwater and therefore not likely to be pathogenic to humans, to, to humans or animals or plants. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I have uh, out of curiosity. So they say you find uh, good bacteria or fungi that can be great mastery from the CIA. So uh, what will be the next problem that means that uh, is going to be control in one or Right. So if we genetically engineer, well, if we firstly find strains or species that of bacteria or fungi that can really effectively degrade plastic polymers, um, we're not going to be sprinkling them around in the environment. We have to rethink how plastics are disposed of. We have to stop using single-use plastics and then just throwing them into the environment and expecting the environment to take care of them because we know that this doesn't work. It's led to plastic pollution on a global scale and microplastics and nanoplastics, which are a major, major problem, looming ecological disaster for the ocean, essentially. Um, so we have to think of ways that we have to eventually get to the point where there'll be policies where single-use plastics of particular types are like, like polyethylene goes into a polyethylene bag, polypropylene goes into a polypropylene bag, polystyrene into a polystyrene bag. In, in certain jurisdictions in Europe, in, in Germany, in Austria, and in, in Netherlands, plastic recycling is done at the source, at the home, and people put the different kinds of plastic into the, into the particular bags, and then they take it to a recycling facility and put them in bins so that you have a pure source of polyethylene, of polypropylene, and it's not all mixed together. And then those, recycle, those materials have value for recycling. They can be sold at 1,000 euros a ton. In North America, where we have the blue box, everything is commingled and mixed, and it goes to a material recycling facility, and it goes onto a conveyor belt, which shakes it and separates out the metal and the glass, but all the plastic goes into a giant pile, and it's all mixed together, and it has zero value which is why it winds up getting put into shipping containers and being sent originally to China, then they stopped taking it, and then it went to Indonesia and to Malaysia and to Vietnam and places like that. Basically, we're off-sourcing the disposal of these things, and people there, if they have no value for them, they can't make money with it, they just dump it into the rivers and it goes into the ocean, and that's why we have the giant plastic patch. So we have to stop doing that. We have to come up with... We have to understand the mechanisms of plastic degradation by these polymer degrading enzymes and then design engineered processes in contained vessels where we can degrade those polymers into something useful. So that's my vision. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions for David? I have one. Yeah. So you presented that last previous slide there on kind of you know, the benefits, if you like, and how to do international collaborations, and that's our theme. So if you had to point to any challenges, anything that kind of was in your way as you as you move through this journey, what would you say, obviously, you're super successful at having established these, but... Well, I think the major challenge is communication, right? Being able to talk to people and to be able to listen and, and sort of think out, sort of put your ego aside and say, well, I only do this. I'm in this box, and, I, and you're in that box, and... I don't know how I get from my box to your box. I, I guess part of the way it works for me is I don't believe in boxes. Everything is, to me is connected. And because I'm kind of a generalist in a sense, I'm not an engineer. I should have said that right at the beginning. I'm in biosystems engineering, but I'm not an engineer. I'm a biologist, I guess, biotechnology guy. But to me, everything is connected through DNA, right? So whether it's working on insect viruses or... or I don't know what, bacteria or fungi or human genomics, it's all the same stuff, just to different various levels of complexity, but it's the same tools, the same concepts. So it's easy for me to, to relate to what other people are doing. It has been easy, and that's part of why it's been successful. But also because, again, I don't believe in boxes. I don't, sit, I don't think of myself as one thing or another. I don't label myself. And so I'm open to all kinds of things. And I had a conversation with, with uh, Alessandro, I guess, in entomology at lunch, right? And 
you know, he's uh, some of the, the problem is what they say an entomologist. If you're if you're a, a taxonomist and you kind of like Dr. Gibbs in entomology is a really fantastic global leader in taxonomy of bees. Okay, um, so you know his area of focus is so so focused that maybe he doesn't have time to think about other connections. But the thing about insects and many other organisms is that many of them are hard to identify based on morphological features. So DNA is an ideal way of sorting out differences between them in the same way that it is for identifying differences between bacteria and fungi. Or humans, or humans in fact, right? So you know, there is ways, if you can think outside the box, you can find ways of connecting to other people that will augment and enhance your own research by adopting a, a new way of looking at things. And that's how science progresses, right? The science's knowledge is based on the success or failures of experiments in the past. And we have, we come up with these hypotheses and stories to explain phenomenon. And the story changes because the technology changes as allows you to look at the problem in a different way, in a deeper way or a wider way. And you can change, the story changes as technology changes. And so it's the same thing with everything we do. If you're open to new ideas and new technology, you can advance your field more effectively, more successfully than if you're just in your own little box. And you obviously were successful in doing that. Any other questions at this point? Cave. No, one more. Go ahead, Crystal. If you could start over at the beginning, would you change your path? Like you, you did a really interesting path. Well, yeah, that's the thing is I never had a goal. I never had to say, I, you know, some people, you know, say, oh, I want to be a doctor when they're like 10 years old and they go through, through school and become a doctor and then whatever. I just followed my heart. I said, you know, like I said, I was interested in philosophy. I read a lot of literature when I was, in, like when I was a teenager, I read Plato and I read all these kinds of things. I was a nerd, right? I played football and I studied and that was it. So I had really low, no social skills and no social life. Um, but... And, um, but then, uh, so I just kind of went with, the, went with the flow. And as I kind of learned more, I said, oh, insects, that's really interesting. So I kind of, okay, I went into that area. And through that, I said, oh, viruses, that's really interesting. <laughs> but the two are connected, right? And then like from the, back, from the back insect viruses, I got into microbial genomics and the collaboration with, with Nazem and Richard and say, oh, that's really interesting. And because it was an engineering department, it was applied. It was like, oh, let's make hydrogen and, and let's make biofuels from this because it's a, world, a global problem, right? And then from that, I say, oh, well, biofuels is one thing. And now the price of oil went down to $25 a barrel in 2008 and nobody cared about biofuels anymore. Oh, but bioproducts, that's even better because you've got a higher value for the products, right? So then, oh, biodegradable polymers, let's do that kind of thing. So I didn't really have any fixed goals that said I, that I have to do this or I'm going to do this. I just followed, went with the flow. I took what the universe offered and I accepted it and went with the flow because I was curious. I have terminal curiosity, right? So. Uh, David, I Go to another university, or you stop. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are you offering me a job somewhere? <laughs> no, no, I'm happy here. I mean, I, the, okay, the, it's a big advantage. Okay, so I really okay. When I was at UVic, I was in a department of biology, and it was a very fundamental biology department. They were mostly ex-Brits, and very armchair and theoretical. And I was doing applied research, so they kind of you know oh, you do applied research, you know, kind of thing. And then I got the opportunity to come to Biosystems, and I said, oh, this is fantastic, because they do applied research. They get it. And I have had such incredible, productive, and happy collaborations with the engineers. I'm not an engineer, but I get what they're doing. I understand the engineering. Maybe I'm, I'm a wannabe engineer. Maybe I should go back and do engineering. <laughs> but, but the point is that they've been really open and receptive and we've developed really strong and productive collaborations because what I bring can complement and enhance what they're doing and what they're doing complements and enhance what I'm doing. So that's what it's all about. Last one to Patty and then we'll close up. Go ahead, Patty. Yes. Um, your ultimate goal sounds like you need to address the 
against public policy or um, buying habits. Um, but I don't see any of my fellow economists here or anybody from the Asper School. Is that later, or is there a benefit to bring those in? And I, I partly ask this because I well, recently did an MBA here, and in our little company, we took Dr. Lou's antimicrobial uh, molecule and tried to commercialize it. Right. And it was very difficult even to come up with yeah. an idea that would make sense, so they did carry it on and try that. So, when do we bring the, the business side in and the public policy? Well, I, I, that's a fantastic question. And I think we've just started to do that. So one of my colleagues and I, Joe Ackerman, Joe, Joe is the director of the uh, Sustainability in Action Facility for Biosystems Engineering. And two years ago, he got some money from our department chair, uh, Dr. Mann, to go to Europe, to Germany and Austria and Netherlands, to see what kind of recycling they do that works. And as a consequence of that, <clears throat> that journey and the knowledge that he gained, we published a paper together in the Journal of Environmental Management, which is all about the problem with recycling in North America. And as we develop the technology for, degradate, for degrading different kinds of polymers, and if we bring it to fruition, we will need to bring in, we need to have industry. In fact, Dr. Budisa and I are going to see the technology and transfer office people tomorrow, actually it's online, to talk about commercializing or patenting some of the technology that may be coming out of our collaboration. But the policy stuff is very important as well, and we won't be able to influence policy until we have solid information about how to do that, about how the policy should change, right? But people are thinking about this all the time, but nobody's really, nobody really has a clear path of how do you change consumer, um, consumer behavior and get them to recycle at home. Everybody now has bought into the blue box and everybody says, oh, I've done my job, I put stuff into the blue box. But if you go to any blue box or blue container in campus, it's overflowing with all kinds of stuff that is not even recyclable. So nobody really is buying into it. They just say, oh, I've done my job, I've recycled it. But it's not, right? So yeah, I would love to talk more about that. If you have some other time, we can meet and talk about that, it'd be great. Well, thank you. I think I'll close the session here. Thank you, David. Please join me in thanking David on my side. And before we close, I just want to make a couple announcements of upcoming events. So we have the Craft Lecture, uh, October 20th. Uh, that's uh, a Friday, 3 p.m. in Room 130 Agriculture. And uh, the speaker will be Dr. Jim Merkamen from UBC. And the title is, actually I had a chuckle at the end of this one, What can we learn from commodity features and option price about pandemics, wars, and other frightening things? So I don't know what he means by that, but I'll be there listening in. <laughs> the second lecture uh, that will be uh, part of our upcoming events is the Bendelow Lecture as part of the faculty seminar series. That's October 24th. Uh, in 172 Agriculture, and the presenter is Dr. Ian Thomas Baldwin from the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, and his title, uh, the, talk of his, the title of his talk is How Native Plants Manage Complicated Ecological Interactions. So I hope to see you all there. Great rest of the evening.